everybody here welcome to my channel and happy wednesday to you i hope you're having a great day so far i hope you're washing your hands wearing a mask and social distancing today i am going to be reviewing one of my favorite books and that is we need new names by no violet blow are you to give you guys a glimpse into the author's life her actual name is elizabeth and no violet in debele because she comes from blow are you zimbabwe no no means whip and violet is her mother's name who died when she was 18 and i was watching one of her um, uh discussions when she was talking about the book and she was saying that uh when her mother died they never used to talk about her because she died when she was very young so writing this book and also like changing her name to no violet which means with violet mean was actually a way of honoring her and blawayo it's um one of the major cities in Zimbabwe so it was actually kind of commemorating her people who are the Ndebele people and just from the name itself you can tell that this book is going to be amazing and i am going to be reading some of the things which stood out for me some of the topics some of the chapters which i really engaged with which i really connected with and i hope you guys will also feel the same way the novel is narrated by Tinero Darling who is a girl who lives in paradise which is a shanty town and they've been moved to where they used to live and then they moved to paradise and i'm just going to touch on some of the topics because there are so so many topics but the thing that really stood out for me or what really connected me with this book is the fact that darling moved from zimbabwe to america and the whole book is about her transition you know like her physical her emotion her mental um transition from being in zimbabwe and going to america and I could relate with this because if if you've watched some of my videos I was saying that what really got me into reading African literature was because I was trying to find myself I was trying to find my identity because I I'd, I'd been away from home for a very long time and I was homesick and also no violet said that what inspired her to write this book was actually because she was yearning for home she was desperate and she wanted a connection with home and that's what that's how she ended up writing this book and it had been 13 years before she went home when she wrote this book so i'll be reading some of the chapters which stood out for me and i'll be telling you guys some of the things that i encountered which also um a part or actually link with the topics that i'll be talking about so let's get into it number 1 obviously we need to talk about the names so we need new names is a book like i said narrated by 10 year old uh darling who's moving from zimbabwe going to america and some of the names that they have in this book like the names that the children have of friends that is they are actually very zimbabwean only because in zimbabwe some people have very peculiar names if i should say and because of our culture i think most african cultures our names all have a meaning because we believe that the kind of name that you have especially if it's in your native language it will actually resemble something in your life i'm not sure if that's always the case but in my case my name is rudum rudum actually means love in my language and I don't know if it's something that I suit all the time but I try. But anyway, so some of the names that I'll be reading out they're quite they're quite peculiar like I said. So there's Busted, there's Born Free, there's Darling, there's Chiboja, quite okay. And then the prophet's name, I don't you know what? I'm just going to say because I'm reviewing a book. I did not write this. I'm just reviewing a book, okay. The prophet's name is actually called uh Prophet Revelations Bichinto and Boro and uh in my language the last name actually means something which I'm not going to say because I think it also means the same in Swahili so if there are other people who actually speak Swahili I'm pretty sure they've got the sense of what it means but yeah when it comes to names I think that's why she said that we need new names because some of the names like if you say busted you can see how that's going to affect the child even if they grow even if they don't understand what it means obviously it's a young at a young age you know but as they grow people obviously make fun of them and sometimes it might reflect on the character that is born free that is darling because even with darling it's not a name that you hear quite a lot but then the author explains that it was actually a best friend's name so it's actually something that she she's experienced herself and i too have experienced people with uh names like this i remember earlier today on twitter i was actually reading someone was saying i've met someone whose name is finish and i was saying that's very zimbabwean because i'm not really sure where it comes from but some of the names that they give their children i'm not sure if it's because of things that they've heard or it's just like a random word which comes out of your head 
but yeah i think that was the root of um how she actually ended up writing this name and also the name of the book so i'm going to read an excerpt from uh chapter five which is how they appeared so this is explaining how they ended up in paradise because they did not used to live in paradise in zimbabwe there's this thing called um Rambachina, and that's when they clear uh spaces or places where let's say if you have property and you don't have like title deeds or it's, it's a place where you're not supposed to build a house and you build it they actually destroy it doesn't matter if it's like a two-story house and it's actually sad because history keeps repeating itself it's currently happening now i remember a few months ago yeah it was actually during covid it actually happened again in another area in zimbabwe so this is something which is still happening now when they just the government which is or the council would just you know destroy houses because they feel like you know it was not supposed to be there and someone would have worked very hard to build a house but it's it's actually quite sad so i'm going to read how they actually ended up in paradise which is the shanty town okay um they did not come to paradise coming would mean that they were choosers that they first looked at the sun sat down with crossed legs picked their teeth and pondered the decision that they had the time to gaze at their reflections in long mirrors perhaps pat their hair tighten their belts check the watches on their wrists before looking at the red road and finally announcing now we are ready for this they did not come no they just appeared they appeared one by one two by two three by three they appeared single files they appeared single file like ants in swarms like flies in angry waves like a wretched sea they appeared in the early early morning in the afternoon in the dead of night they appeared with the dust from the crushed houses clinging to their hair and skin and clothes making them appear like things from another life swollen ankles and blisters under their feet they appeared fatigued by the long walk they appeared carrying sticks with which they marked the ground for where a shack would begin and end and these they carefully passed around partitioning the new land and hands shaking like they were killing something squatting to to mark the ground like that they appeared broken shards of glass people so obviously from the diction i love how she writes because you can actually see it i all i always admire i always like authors who actually paint a picture with the words and with this you can actually see that these people how it's explained these people do not plan to come to paradise they just appeared because of the circumstance you know they were actually moved away from where they used to live and this is actually the beginning of uh darling's journey because in the book she actually says when she's in the sh she's in the shack and she's talking about how her mom you know now she has to like sleep with people to get money she actually talks that they never used to be like this they actually used to live in a very big house a very nice house but because of that because of the home around between they actually have to move so this is actually something that stood out to me because as much as this book was written i think um i think it was written around 2013 and also because like the history which is reflected here is quite earlier because she's also talking about how there was a place called budapest where white people used to live and the black people in zimbabwe in that area they they were actually putting them out of their houses they were going in their houses eating their food actually killing them so this is something that actually happened quite a while back but i remember i think i was in high school and actually it happened to the farmers in zimbabwe uh i wasn't very how do i say this i wasn't really aware of it or exposed to it. it was just something that i would hear that oh you know they've put it farmers out of zimbabwe because of this and that i was quite young but now that i'm also seeing that this happened like prior you know it's something which also shows that history keeps repeating itself so yeah this actually stood out for me and i'll also be reading some of the things that stood out for me the other reason which i found this book to be very captivating is it's narrated by a child if you read a book which is narrated by a child obviously it's written by an adult but children have that if this innocence in them that they say things exactly as they are and to them they they do not really i wouldn't say they don't really think but it's just what they say things as they see them you know they don't really um, process it in the way that adults do obviously with adults we have a way of hiding things or trying to shield ourselves from certain emotions embarrassment you know but with 
with children they say things as they were as they are so with darling the way that she explains everything even when she's talking about how her father has hiv the way she describes his lips his hair how he's very you know how he's lost so much weight you can say that you can see that this is coming from a child because i remember i used to have so many relatives who died from the who died from hiv and because i was very young we never really used to talk about them it was until i'm way older now that i'm also included in you know family discussions that i actually got to understand that this person had hiv and you can actually see the stigma around it you know we're not supposed to be like near them in their rooms you know it was just they're sick but you never really know how they were sick and with this darling really narrates how a father could not do anything how he was you know defecating on himself and you know it was just it was just a lot especially for a 10 year old and that the way she just took it is something which is quite normal you know these are things that uh quite damage children as they grow but with darling because well i think it's like an african thing if it's like if it's happening then it's happening you just move on just like that and i think this is something that she carries on with and i really like that because if something is told from a child's point of view you know you just see exactly as it is there isn't like much with um trying to hide certain emotions like i said before so the next chapter i'm going to read is called how they left so the writer said when she was writing uh, this chapter it was you know to to show how people end up leaving the countries and this was after she had seen people crossing the border from zimbabwe to south africa but it actually relates to every immigrant especially if you're coming from zimbabwe and you're going to a different country i think this really speaks to us and how we we don't always go by choice but it's because of you know our government failing us that we end up leaving the country in droves so i'm just going to read part of that how they left look at them living in droves the children of the land just look at them living in droves those with nothing are crossing borders those with those with strength are crossing the borders those with ambitions are crossing borders those with hopes are crossing borders those with loss are crossing borders those in pain are crossing borders moving running emigrating going deserting walking quitting flying fleeing to all over to countries near and far to countries unheard of to countries whose names they cannot pronounce they are living in droves when things fall apart the children of the land scurry and scatter like birds escaping a burning sky they flee their own wretched land so their hunger may be pacified in foreign lands their tears wiped away in strangers lands the wounds of their despair bandaged in faraway lands their blistered prayers murdered in darkness of queer lands look at the children of the land living in droves leaving their own land with bleeding wounds on their bodies and shook on their faces and blood in their hearts and hunger in their stomachs and grief in their footsteps leaving their mothers and fathers and children behind leaving the umb umbilical cords underneath the soil leaving the bones of their ancestors in the earth leaving everything that makes them who and what they are living because it is no longer possible to stay they will never be the same again because you just cannot be the same once you leave behind who and what you are you just cannot be the same looking at them living in droves despite knowing they will be welcomed with restraint in those strange lands because they do not they do not belong knowing they'll have to sit on on one buttock because they must not sit comfortably lest they be asked to rise and leave knowing they will speak in dampened whispers with because they must not let their voices drown those of those of the owners of the land knowing they will have to walk on their toes because they must not leave footprints on the new earth lest they must lest they be mistaken for those who want to claim the land as theirs look at them living in droves arm in arm with loss and lost looking at them look at them living in droves so i think uh this one actually he's home because it really explains how when you move from your from your country you leave so much you leave your parents you leave your children and i like the statement of how you you leave your umbilical cord because i think in zimbabwe we have this culture that when a child is born you cut it uh, and then you bury it in the soil i think it's a way of calling them home 
I'm not very sure, but I think I've heard someone say that it's a way of calling them home. So it's actually um, a poetic way of like you're leaving who you are at home. And how she actually explains that uh, the transition from coming from your homeland and then going to a different country, because all of course you know there is better, not always, because I think we need to have a discussion where we have to talk about like the transition of moving to a new country. Of course people only look at the financial side but they don't look at the emotional side how it affects you mentally emotionally even physically because when you move to a new land uh, I think I've talked about this so much now I'm starting to sound like a cliche but you don't feel like you belong because when I moved here obviously I realized okay I'm black I'm African and it took me a while I think over five years for me to say this might be home you know not entirely i'm not there yet because i don't feel like i belong here you know not only because uh, i'm not white or anything but there's just this loss where, where i don't feel comfortable like how she's saying that you have to sit with one buttock just in case you're told um you have to rise and leave because you never really know you know anything can happen obviously with all these whole brexit things now you're just on urge you know with everything that is happening in certain countries and also there's racism i think people tend to forget that people think that racism is something that you can ignore but in england there's actually institutional racism for someone like me for example my name is rudomanir obviously if they see my name is just going to be like okay she's african to them not all of them obviously but most of them once they see that my name is like african they're just going to stereotype me to think that okay maybe she can't speak english maybe she can't do this maybe she can't do that because i've had so many incidents where people think i can't speak english and i'm just like okay we actually have schools in zimbabwe you know i i can really i can construct in a sentence in english and it's quite hurtful you know that you're just being judged by the color of your skin also by you know your name because i remember there's this guy i was talking to he's from nigeria and he was saying he started engineering yeah i think he did engineering or was it accounting anyway between the two and he was saying he had a he had a, he had a uh he had a friend of his who's white who is british and they both um submitted their cvs to this company and his was actually much better than the white guy but the white guy ended up getting the job and obviously was like you know what i just don't think i don't want to be biased of, of, of course at first you never really think it's because of racism you just think okay maybe they wanted someone else but he kept on trying and then he sent the guys his friend's cv with his name on it and they still said no so after a while you kind of get to understand that okay is the, is that why because some of the some of the time is because i think white people most of them are afraid to pronounce their names wrongly so they kind of like separate themselves from that so that they don't you know they don't have to deal with it so when you come to a different country it's it's quite a lot to be honest you know and people think especially like when they're back home they think oh you're getting all the money you have all these cars you have all this and we do but that doesn't mean that we're not going through a lot you know and it's not i'm saying i'm not saying this just to like show off or anything i'm saying yes we have easy access to certain things that people back in zimbabwe do not have easy access to but doesn't mean we don't have any problems you know i remember last year about five zimbabweans died here in this country and they didn't have anyone you know to take care of them so i think even up to now they're still in the mortuary you know so people here they have certain problems some of them they work back-to-back -back shifts and there's actually a chapter which i'm going to read which also which talks about that that at times people back home they don't see all these things they just see you know they just see the money and i've heard so many of my family members saying that every time when they send someone in zimbabwe money as soon as they receive it they don't say anything at all they don't say i've received it or thank you not that you're sending it to to be told that thank you but just to alert that you've received it it's just like once they get the money that's it you know you're just like a bank and especially in these trying times most zimbabweans most black people they're in the front line they're key workers if your family and friends who are in the diaspora by all means please just check on them you know just just check on them just hear how they are without asking for anything without asking for money ask how they are because they yearn for that they want someone to ask them it's because this COVID-19 thing is not playing, you guys. It's, it's real, you know, people are dying in droves. And I think it would be very important and some, and very nice to just, for you to just check up on your family. It's the least that you can do. So, yeah. The next uh, part 
chapter uh, is actually an excerpt from a, a chapter called uh, Angel and this one has to do with accents so obviously most people when some not everyone when they move to a new country you know they're excited about gain gaining uh, a new accent so that they can show off to certain people I've been accused of this but to be honest for me I had to adjust because I was so tired of having to repeat myself I'll tell you a story after I repeat this because after I read this chapter I was like I'm not the only one you know there's so many people who are tired of having to re repeat themselves so I'm just going to read this then I'll tell you my story so here it goes I've decided the best way to deal with it all is to sound American and the TV has taught me just how to do it it's pretty easy all you have to do is watch Dora the Explorer the Simpsons Spongebob Scooby-Doo and then you move on to That's a Raven Glee Friends Golden Girls and so on just listening and imitating the accents if you do it well then before you know it nobody will ask you to repeat what you what you said I also have uh, my list of Ameri American words that I keep under the tongue like ta talismans, ready to use, pretty good, pain in the ass, for real, awesome, totally, skinny, dude, freaking, bizarre, psyched, messed up, like, tripping, uh, clearance, allowance, douchebag, you're welcome, acting up, yikes. The TV has also taught me that if I'm talking to someone, I have to look I have to look him in the eye, even if it is an adult, even if it's rude. I don't know why Auntie for Selena doesn't think to learn American speech like this, seeing how it would make her life easier, so she she wouldn't have to have a hard time like she's, she is right now. I say the angel collection, Auntie for, for Selena is saying, she has muted the TV and raised the volume of the handset, so I can hear the other person as well. She sounds like a bored young girl. I'm sorry, what? I mean, I didn't quite hear that. Maybe it's my line. I can picture her head caught the young girl, a frown of concentration on her face. So this is when Auntie Fossilina is trying to buy a perfume online, but she had to call first, or they didn't, it wasn't online, so she had to call the shop so that she could ask about the information. Auntie Fossilina, by the way, is Darling's aunt who she's staying with in America. So just to give you guys the background. Uh, so this is a conversation that she's having with a salesperson on the phone. And yeah, here it goes. Um, angel, angel, angel. Aunt for Selena says, raising her voice even louder. They silence, like many, like maybe the girl is uh, getting ready to, to pray. Angel. Aunt for Selena adds helpfully dragging out the words like she is raking gravel. I, silen I silently mouth, angel, angel, I hear the girl make a small sigh. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean, ma'am, she says finally. You can, tell, you can tell from your voice that she is getting tired from trying to understand. What do you mean you don't know what I mean? You don't understand what I'm saying? Such a simple word, Aunt for Selena says. She's speaking with her hand and head now, and I can tell she tell from her knotted face that if the girl doesn't get it soon it's not going to be good i clear my throat to remind aunt for selena that i'm in the room so maybe she will ask me to speak for her but she doesn't now she has scribbled the word angel all over the magazine and the naked woman with the bra and underwear is all closed with blank with black ink the letters like tiny angry insects ma'am i'm terribly sorry we are having these difficulties but we have a website that you can order. The girl on the phone starts, her voice suddenly lifting. You can, t you can tell that she is pleased with the fact that she has thought of the website, that things are going to work out after all. I'm relieved as well, and I start thinking maybe I should run upstairs and grab my MacBook for Aunt for Selena to use. I get up from the couch. No, I'm not. Ordering online, Aunt for Selena says, firmly separating her words now which is never a good sign. I sit back down. She pokes the Victoria's Secret woman's face with a pen as she says each word. I'm not ordering online, I'm speaking in English. So as far as I'm concerned, maybe you can spell it. Now the girl sounds like she's getting annoyed. Like maybe she's saying some serious, some serious insult inside her head and she can't say it out loud. Uh, 
now you want me to spell it and for selena says she looks at me like she can't believe what she is hearing but i look away at the tv the woman is gone there's a new one sitting on an exercising ball i'm i'm waiting for aunt for selena to tell the girl on the phone off because that's what she sounds like she's getting ready to do but but something changes in her mind and she sits up and starts to spell it's a and for selena says her voice is a bit calmer she has written the, the letter on the magazine as if to be sure okay a is for apple not apple a is for anus it's a, it's a different sound n as in no g as in god e as in eat l as in libya there you go angel 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 and for selena says there is a brief silence like maybe the girl is considering what she has written and then she says oh you mean angel she, yes angel that's what i was trying to tell you all this time i want a red one and for selena says rolling it r the sound the sound of it like something is vibrating inside your mouth and i promise myself i will never ever sound like that when Aunt Forcelina gets off the phone with the Victoria's Secret lady, she dials a number that must be busy because she quickly hangs up. She immediately dials another and she has to hold for a little while before I hear her leave a message in our language for the other person to call her back. I know the reason Aunt Forcelina is calling is that she needs to tell Victoria's Secret story to someone in our language because this is what she must do in, Ameri in America whenever something like this happens. We have to tell it to someone who knows what she needs. Who will understand exactly what you say and that is and that that it is not your fault but the other person's someone who knows that english is like a huge iron door and you are always losing the keys after leaving her message and for selena just sits there as if something important is happening inside her and she's waiting for it to come out kneel in front of her and announce that it's finished and can it please go attend to other business she also has this look i've never seen i've seen it many times before but i still don't know whether to call it pain or anger or sadness or whether it has a name i'm careful not to meet her eyes as she puts her card back in her purse and then gets up walks downstairs to the basement and slams the door shut behind her i know that she will turn on the lights as she descends the creaking stairway that she will take small measured steps like there's something down there that she dreads that when she gets to the bottom she will stand in front of the mirror that covers one wall and looks at her reflection i know that she won't be looking at her thinness but it but at her mouth i know that she will stand there and start con conversation all over and say out loud in careful english all the things that she means meant to say that she should have said to the girl on the phone but did not because she could not find the words at the time i know that in front of that mirror and for selena will be articulate that english will come alive on her tongue and she will spit it like it's burning her mouth like it's poison like it's the only language she's ever known so i hope you get to understand the pain uh and for selena had to go having to uh repeat yourself all the time because i think that's how most times people end up adjusting the accents. I remember a friend of mine uh, when London this other day and we're hanging out and he I noticed that his accent is had changed a lot and he was actually saying the reason why is because I'm so tired of having to repeat myself and you had to adjust because if you don't they'll keep saying what what did you say and I remember this other day when I was in Manchester with my cousin I don't remember what exactly we're talking about but then I said, oh, I'm not very comfortable. And then she said, what did you say? I said, I'm not comfortable. And she said, I, I'm not sure I know what you mean. I said, I'm not comfortable. And then she said, do you mean comfortable? I was like, yes, I mean comfortable. So from then onwards, you can see that at times, you don't necessarily have to adjust, but at times you get to a point where you're like, okay, it's not that I don't know how to speak English, but it's just the way you pronounce things. And especially in Zimbabwe, we are very strong on the R's. Like even with syllables, we also add our extra own syllables to it. And it's not because if you don't know how to speak English or you don't have an accent, doesn't mean you don't know how to speak English, you know. But I think that's something we have to adjust to, uh, when we move to a, to a different country. You have to do as the Romans do. And as sad as it seems because other people, they end up watering this themselves. You know trying exactly to merge with the people of the land but you know for me 
that was actually a wake up call and also this other time i was talking to this guy i wanted to go to london and i was saying oh i want to go to london and he was like what i said i want to go to london and he was like there's no air in london it's actually london and i was like is that not what i was saying so you know they it actually comes to a point when you're like okay maybe i have to adjust but you don't necessarily have to i remember shimamanda was saying that she had to lose the american accent because she was so tired of having to adjust and she just had to come to herself and i think that's also a very powerful thing you know and yeah that that's actually one of the things that stood up for me and i hope it also helps someone who's going through this thing of accents and trying to adjust you don't necessarily have to you know but issue their own the last chapter i'm going to read is called how they lived so this one is very very long but i'm not going to read all of it i'm just going to read parts of it and basically it's explaining how people in the diaspora live and how they go about day-to-day -day life so it's like um, a lot of things in one chapter based on physically emotionally mentally what they go through what we go through so i'm going to start and when they asked us where we were from, we exchanged glances and smiled with the shyness of child brides. They said Africa. We nodded yes. What part of Africa? We smiled. Is it that part where vultures wait for famished children to die? We smiled. Where the life expectancy is 35 years? We smiled. Is it, is it there where dissidents shove AK-47s between women's legs? We smiled. Where people run around naked? We smiled that part where they massacred each other we smiled is it where the old president rigged the elections and people were tortured and killed and a whole bunch of them put in prison and all in all the all there were uh where they are dying of cholera oh my goodness yes we've seen your country it's been on the news and and when these words tumbled from their lips like like crashed bricks we exchanged glances again and the water in our eyes broke our smiles melted with dying shadows and we wept we wept for our blessed wretched country we wept and wept they pitied us and said it's okay it's okay you're an american now and still we wept and wept and wept and they gave us soft little thing is and said here here's some clinics here and we took the soft things and put them in our pockets to look to look at later and we wept still wept like widows wept like orphans in america we saw some food that we had seen we had seen in all our lives um, and we were so happy we rummaged through the dustbin of our souls to retrieve the stained broken pieces of cotton we had hung him in there way back when we were still in our own countries flung him during desperate, desperate moments when we were dizzy with hunger and with, and and we thought, how can he, how can he, will not pity us? How come? Oh, sorry. How come he will not pity us? How come? Thought. Why does he not hear us? Why? Thought. How come he? We ask and ask and ask and still are not given, even a model. How? How come? And blind with rage, we flush him away and say, Better not God. Better not God. And live like this, praying like like this. The things that will come, that will never come. Better know God. But then, when we, when we got to America and saw all that we, we held our breath and thought, wait, there must be a God. So happy and grateful, we found this discarded pieces and put them together. We crazy glue, bought at the dollar store for only ninety nine cents and said, In God we trust you now. In God we trust you. Now. And began praying again. At McDonald's, we devoured big bags and moved down fries and guzzled supersized goods. Excuse me. At Burger King, we worshipped whoppers. At KFC, we mold bucket, uh, bucket chicken. We went to Chinese buffets and ate and ate all we could inhale: fried rice, chicken, beef, shrimp, and as and as for the things those names you cannot read, we simply pointed and said. We ate like pigs, like foods, like dignitaries. We ate like vultures, like stray dogs, like monsters. We ate like kings. We ate, we ate for all uh, our past hunger, for our parents and our brothers and sisters and relatives and friends. We were still back there. We uttered the names between mothers, pointed up their hungry faces in the chapter, enjoying for those who could not be with us to eat food for themselves. And and when we were full, we carried our dense bodies with the dignity of elephants. If only our country could see us in America, see us eat like things in a land that was not ours. How America surprised.
surprise us. A surprise us at first. If you were not happy with your body, you could go to a doctor and say, for instance, doctor, I was born in the wrong body. Just make me right. Doctor, I don't like this nose. This breast, this lips. We looked at we looked at people sending their aging parents away to take to be taken to be taken care of by strangers. We looked at parents not being allowed to be their own children. We looked at strangers. Strange things like these, things we had never seen in our lives and say, what kind of land is this? Just what kind of land? Because we were not in our country, we could not use our own language. And so when we spoke, our voices came out bruised. When we talked, our tongues thrashed madly in our mouth, staggered like um, drunken men because we were not using our languages. We said things we did not mean and we really wanted to say what we really wanted to say remained forged inside, trapped. In America, we do not always have the words. It was only when we were by ourselves that we spoke in our real voices. When we were alone, we summoned the horses in our languages and mounted the backs and galloped past sky skyscrapers. Always, we were reluctant to come back down. How hard it was to get to America, harder than crawling through the anus of a needle. For the visas, the passwords, we begged, despaired, lied, groveled, promised, charmed, bribed, anything to get us out of the country. For his visa and travel, Shaka Zulu sold all of his father's cows against the old man's wishes. Perseverance had to take his sister Nitsai out of school. Ko worked the, the fields of Botswana for nine months. Nozipo, like uh, Primrose and Sik Cicelo Kule and my day slept with that fat black pig, Banyele Koza from the passport office. Girls flat on the back, Banyele between the legs. America on the mines. To send us off properly, our elders spitted tobacco on the dry earth to summon the spirit of the ancestors for our protection. Unlike in years, unlike in years long gone, the spirits did not come dancing from the land beneath. They crawled. They stored, they were hungry, they wanted blood and meat and millet beer, they wanted sacrifices, they wanted gifts, and save for a few grains of tobacco, we had nothing to give, absolutely nothing. And so the spirits just gazed at us with eyes milked dry of care. Between themselves they whispered, how will these ones ever be whole in that melika? As far from the graves of the ancestors as it is. Do people not live in fear in Melika, fear of evil? Do they not say it? Do they not say it is like a grave in that Melika? That going there is like burying yourself because your people may never see you again. Is it not a Melika? Also, that wretched place where they took looted black sons and daughters those many, many years ago. We heard all this, but we let it enter in one ear and live through the other, pretending we did not hear. We would not be moved. We would not listen. We were going to America. In the footsteps of these looted black sons and daughters, we were going, yes, we were going. And when we got to America, we took our dreams, looked at them tenderly as if they were newly born children and put them away. We would not be, pers we would not be pursuing them. We would never be the things we had wanted to be. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers, no school for us. Even though our visas were school visas, we knew we did not have the money for school to begin with, but we had applied for school visas because that was the only way out. Instead of going to school, we worked. Our social security cards said valid for work only with INS authorization, but we created our teeth and broke the law and worked. What else would we do? What could we have done? What could anybody have done? And because we were breaking the law, we dropped our heads in shame. We'd never broken any laws before. We dropped our heads because we were no longer people. We were now illegals. When they debated what to do with illegals, we stopped breathing, stopped laughing, stopped everything and listened. We heard exporting America, broken borders, war on the middle on the middle class, invasion, deportation, illegals, illegals, illegals. We beat our tongues till we till we tasted blood sat tensely on a, on one butt on one butt cheek afraid to sit on both because we can how can you sit properly when you don't know about you tomorrow 
and because we're illegal and afraid to be discovered we mostly kept to ourselves stuck to our kind and shied away from those who were not like us we did not we did not know what they would think of us what they would do about us we did not want their wrath we did not want their curiosity we did not want any attention we did not meet stairs and we did not meet stairs and we avoided gazes we hid our real names gave false ones when when asked we built mountains between us and them we dug rivers we planted thorns we had paid no much to be in america and we did not want to lose it all when they talked about employers checking on workers our hearts sank we, we recalled the tatters of our country left behind barely held together by american dollars by monies from other countries and our blood went cold and when all work and when sorry and when at work they asked for our papers we scurried like settled hands and flocked to unwanted jobs where we met uh, the others many others others with names like myths names like puzzles names we had never heard Fijilio, Balamuguntan, Faham, Abdulraman, Aziz, ba Baako, Dahun, Osman, Kimatsu when it was hard to say the many strange names we called them by their countries so how on earth did you do you do this Sri Lanka Mexico are you are you coming or what is it really true you sold a kidney to come to America India guys just give Shaka Zuli a break the guy is old I'm just saying we know you you despise this job Sudan but deal with it come Ethiopia move move Israel Kazakhstan Niger brothers let's go the others spoke languages we did not know worshipped different gods ate what we would not dare touch but like us they left their homelands behind they flipped open their wallets to show us faded photographs of mothers whose faces bore the same creases of worry as our very own mothers siblings bleak-eyed with dreams unfulfilled like those of our own fathers fallen and defeated like ours we had never seen their countries but we knew about everything in those pictures we were not altogether strangers and the jobs we worked jesus 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 the jobs we worked low paying jobs back breaking jobs jobs that gnawed at the bones of our dignity devoured the meat touched tongued the marrow we we took scolding iron and ironed our flat pride we cleaned toilets we picked tobacco and fruits under the boiling sun until we hung our tongues and painted like lost and panted like lost hounds we butchered animals slit throats drained blood we worked with dangerous machines holding our breath like crocodiles underwater our minds on the money and never on our lives adamo adamo got murdered by that beast of a machine that also ate three fingers of sudan's left hand we cut ourselves working on meat we got skin diseases we inhaled bad, bad smells until our lungs thundered. Ecuador fell from 40 stories, working on a roof and shattered his spine, screaming, Miss Hills, Miss Hills. On his way down, we got sick but did not go to hospital, could not go to, could not go to hospitals. We swallowed every pain like a bitter pill, drank every fear like a love portion, and we worked and worked. Every two weeks, we got our paychecks and sent monies back home by Western Unions and MoneyGram. We bought food and clothes for the families left behind. We paid school fees for the little ones. We got messages that said hunger, that said help, that said kunzima, and we went and we sent money. When we were asked, "You guys work so hard. Why do you all work so hard?" We smiled. Excuse me. And every every so often. We listened over the phone to the voices of our parents and elders, shy voices telling us what was needed. They had long since ceased to be provided for us. We're now their parents. Our extended family sent requests and we worked, worked like donkeys, worked like slaves, worked like madmen. When we hesitated, they said, you're in America where everyone has money. We see it all on TV. Please don't deny us. Madhudavakumana, how we worked. We had never seen such a big monster in our country. It was like there was many, there were many countries in it. Michigan, Texas, New York, Atlanta, Ohio, Kansas, DC, California, and so many others. 
we want to place it and took took lots of pictures and send them home so they could see us in America we took pictures outside the White House we took pictures leaning against the Lady Liberty as if she were our grandmother we took pictures at the Niagara Falls at the Times Square we took pictures with dolphins in Florida we took pictures at the Grand Canyon we went everywhere and took and took and took pictures and sent them home showing off a country that would never be ours and when those of and those at home saw the pictures and wanted to come and see America for themselves we said sure we are Nini Shoyai, you're welcome to come. We sent them monies for visas and tickets and they came. It was mostly the youth who came, leaving behind old people and children. They came in droves, abandoning the Tatars that were our countries. We do not think about mending the Tatars. All we thought was leave, abandon, flee, run, anything, escape. And when they came to join us in America, hungry and hollow and hopeful, we held them tight and welcomed them to a home that was not ours we smelled their hair and clothes we begged them for news for our land big news small news any news we asked them to describe how the earth smelled right before it rained to describe how after the rain flying ants exploded from the from the ground like fireworks we asked is it the city is, is the city hall still the same the thread gold building and Rankini, the jacaranda trees that shine that line the streets in town do they still bloom that dizzying purple is that crazy prophet's revelations bitching don't borrow still there <laughs> sorry <laughs> you're afraid for me to get my visa can you believe it what about main street does it still flow like a river and does that blind beggar still sit outside spa supermarket and, uh, and sing uh tabati si Bambano Ulandel. I'm so sorry about this. My pronunciation is so off. I'm going to be learning in Gemele, by the way, so don't lose hope in me. Uh, we asked the arrivals all these questions and I wanted them as they and watched them as they spoke. We wanted to put our heads in the mouth to catch every precious word, every feeling. And then came the times we called home and young strangers answered the phone and and we said, Who are you? And they said, I'm Tabani San Lungile. I'm Nyarai's daughter, Trisha. I'm Prayer's second son, Garikai. We listened to these strangers and said, Jesus, Tabani is a parent now. Nyarai is a daughter now. Prayer is a parent now. When it is, when it happened, when did it happen? When did all these ch children have their own uh, children? That is how time flies. It flew and we did not see it fly. We did not go home. We did not go back home to visit because we did not have the papers for our return and so we just stayed knowing that we, knowing that if we went we would not be able to re-enter america we stayed like prisoners only we chose to be prisoners and we loved our prison it was not a bad prison and when things only got worse in our country we pulled our shackles even tighter and said we are not leaving america no we are not leaving and then our own children were born we held the american birth certificates tight we do not name our children after our parents after ourselves we feared it if we did they would not be able to say their own names that their friends and teachers would not know how to call them we gave them names that would uh, make them belong in america names that did not mean anything to us aaron josh dana corey jack kathleen when our children when our children were born we did not bury the umbilical cord under the earth to bind them to the land because we had no land to call our own. We did not hold their, ha their heads after smoking herb uh, to make them strong. We did not tie uh, fetishes around their waists to protect them from evil spirits. We did not brew beer and spill tobacco on the earth to announce their arrival to the ancestors. Instead, we smiled. And, and when our parents reminded us over the phone that it had been so long, it had been a long, long time and that they were getting old and needed to see us needed to meet their grandchildren we said we are coming mama see ya baba we are coming go go to sekur we do not want to tell them we still had no papers and when they grew restless and cursed america for getting the um the greedy monster that swallowed their children swallowed the sons and daughters of uh other lands and refused to spit them out we said 
we are coming very soon we are coming next year and next year came and we said next year and next year came and we said next year and when next year sure came we said next year for real and when next year for real came we said we're coming we'll see you just wait and our parents waited and they saw so that we did not come they died waiting clutching in the dried hands pictures of us leaning against the lady liberty gravels of lost sons and daughters in their hearts old eyes glued on the sky for fuller matinas to bring forth lost sons and daughters we could not attend their funerals because we still had no pa papers and so we moaned from afar we shut ourselves up and turned on the music so we did not raise alarm with on the floor and wailed and wailed and wailed and with our parents gone we told ourselves we have no home anyway how could we go to see if that land we left behind we convinced ourselves that we now belonged only with our children and those children they grew and we had to squint to see ourselves in them they did not speak our language they did not sound like us when they misbehaved we only said no do not do that time out but that is not what we wanted to do what we wanted to do was get switches and caraba and caraba and caraba we wanted to draw blood and teach and teach red war lessons to last them lifetimes we were f but we feared being arrested for bringing up our own children like our parents had brought us when our children were old enough and we told them about our country they did not beg us for stories of the land we had left behind they want they went to their computers and googled and googled and googled when they got off they looked at us with something between pity and horror and say geez you really came from there they did not want to hear the stories of our grandmothers they told us around village fire stories of uh bulaluse benkosi how the rabbi stole its tail suronaguro they would not be part of the horror we had fled. We accepted many things as our children grew, things that baffled us because we had been raised differently. But we, we took it all and said, there is no journey without a price. And this is the price of the long journey we made those many years ago. When our children became adults, they did not ask for our approval to marry. We did not get bride prices, we did not get gifts. At, wed at, at the weddings, we did not spill beer and tobacco on the earth. Did not beat drums, no, th to thank our ancestors. We smiled. Our children raised their families and we did not tell them what to do, how to bring up their children. They hardly came to see us. They were busy with jobs and their, excuse me, new lives. They did not send us money it's like we had sent our parents. When we grew old, they did not beg us to stay with them when we grew old they put us here in these nursing nursing homes where we are taken care of by strangers strangers who have left their countries just just like we left ours those years ago here our our own parents come to us in dreams they do not touch us they do not speak to us they only behold us with with looks we cannot remember when we approach them we find ourselves surrounded by oceans we cannot cross we reach out, we yell, we beg, we plead. It's no use. Always we, we wake from these dreams, groping for, for mirrors. Wounds in our eyes. We see ourselves uh, through se searing uh, pain. When we die, our children will not know how to wail, how to moan us the right way. They will not go mad with grief. They will not pin black cloth on their arms. They will not spill beer and tobacco on the earth they will not sing till their voices are hoarse they will not put our plates and cups on our graves they will not send us away with in, in far trees we will leave for the land of the dead naked without the things we need to enter the castle for ancestors because we will not be proper the spirits will not come running to meet us and so we will wait and wait and wait forever waiting in the air like flags of unsung countries wow oh, so i'm sorry i had to read all of it but um, i actually don't have any, anything more to say after reading this because i think you can tell from the whole chapter exactly what she's talking about and i highly recommend this book you guys especially if you're in the diaspora and you're just trying to find a way home despite which country you are from i think this book brings great comfort and with that thank you and see you next week Bye.